Thank you for joining us for another episode of Boom Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. I'm here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. Our expert panel returns after the tabling of the 2022 federal budget, and we also have more economic news, some of it good and some of it not so good. Let's hear what they have to say. Joining us are the former Harper uh, Government Finance Minister, the Honorable Joe Oliver. We also have the former Ontario Trade and Economic Development Minister, Sandra Pupitello, and former Alberta Cabinet Minister and now head of the Canada West Foundation, the Honorable Gary Marr. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks. Great. Great to be here. First, Joe, I'm going to go to you. Uh, obviously, the budget has been presented by Finance Minister Freeland. What is your initial reaction? Well, my reaction is it could have been even worse. Uh, we, a lot of people were worried because uh, we have a, a coalition, in effect, between the, the Liberals and the NDP, and we have a history of profligacy uh, on the part of the federal government that preceded all the uh, stimulus measures uh, resulting from, from COVID. So uh, there, there was legitimate concern that this could have gotten uh, totally out of control. As it is, um, it's a disappointing uh, budget uh, because there was less emphasis on growth, uh, very little restraint in, in spending, and I think an unawareness uh, about uh, what really could make a difference uh, for, for Canadians. And, and all this is against a backdrop, which is extremely challenging. Uh, fiscally, we have a, a, a debt level at the federal uh, government of, of, of debt of $1.25 billion by the end of this year. We've got inflation at 5.7% in Canada, about 8.5% in the United States. Interest rates uh, are, are on their way up. And of course, the Bank of Canada just uh, moved uh, the bank rate up uh, one half point, which is a, a, a very big move indeed. Um, we've got uh, a deficit this, this year of about uh, 53 or $4 billion. I can't recall the exact number. It's so big. Uh, the, the interest on the debt is now $27 billion each and every year, and that's going to go up as the debt increases and interest rates uh, go up as well. Uh, so we've got enormous challenges, and the longer-term prospects don't look very good either uh, because the, there are forecasts that between 2020 and 2060, uh, Canada's uh, growth rate will be lower than that of the most developed uh, OECD countries. So we're going to fall behind as individuals, uh, the other wealthiest countries in the world. And that's a very sad commentary on government policy. Sandra Pupitello, I suspect you might have a slightly different view. What, what, what's your reaction to the budget? Well, I do. I do think that uh, many of the naysayers, they had already set their hair on fire before the budget was actually tabled. And then they were scrambling to pat it out uh, because it really wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. Uh, and in fact, I think the government has shown a great deal of restraint in terms of what the debt levels are and will be. Um, you can't just cherry pick when it's OK to spend money. Um, it was OK in 08, 09 when we had a great recession, it was certainly okay during the pandemic. And I think this finance minister has shown that now it's time to start tightening it up, but still spend in areas where we know the economy needs help. And I think they've done that. And they're also pointing the way uh, to show how much less that uh, debt to GDP ratio will become. I mean, we will never rival the debt levels of the Mulroney era. So I think we're, we are in good shape. We are getting there. And even if you just look south to our U.S. neighbors, uh, they are in far worse shape. So I think we've actually done quite well uh, as a country. And I think the growth rate that we are seeing in our economy is surprising. They're, it's surprising all the economists. And I think it's hard to get them to smile. And I do think that they're smiling these days. Uh, Gary Barr, I think we're going to have to split your uh, answer into two, but uh, your initial reaction in the 30 seconds before the break. Well, first of all, I want to really make just a couple of points. One is the deficit was not nearly as large as it was projected even six months ago. And that's largely been because of revenues coming from oil and gas. And so the oil and gas industry remains a very important part 
of the economy of Canada. Uh, the second thing is it's a nearly 300 page document with a long list of priorities, eight or nine. Uh, a laundry list doesn't make a plan or a strategy. And we're, so we're gonna cut you off right there. We are gonna go to break. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. Uh, we're here with our monthly panel. Gary Barr, I had to cut you off there. Please continue with your thoughts on the budget. And I also want you to comment, uh, and then we'll take it around uh, the room a little bit too. But uh, Joe Oliver made a comment about uh, our, our long-term prospects for growth. And that OECD chart is actually found in the budget, which has Canada 21st out of 21 countries in terms of prospects for growth. Uh, and I want I want everybody's, including yours, Gary, your comment on whether this budget does, in fact, promote growth. Gary, the floor is yours. Well, there's a number of priorities, as I said, eight or nine priorities, and nine if you include uh, revenue as a priority. Um, you know, some of these things are estimable goals. I mean, I look at the uh, program for carbon capture, utilization, and storage, the Canada Growth Fund. Uh, a new innovation agency. I think some of these are actually laudable goals. Uh, but the challenge that we have, I think that the federal government has demonstrated itself to be pretty good at sending checks to individuals. And the evidence of that was seen during uh, the, you know, COVID and supporting people that needed support. Where the federal government has fallen short in many cases is when they've got big sums of money that they're trying to distribute you know, you've got a whole bunch of unspent money in the Canada Infrastructure Bank, a pretty good idea, but not very well executed. And my concern about this budget, twofold, one is I don't think that there's enough emphasis on growth. It's all about taxation in order to fund these things. And the second thing is there may well be a great deal of uncertainty with respect to the ability of the federal government to implement so many different things in, in a wide list of eight or nine priorities. Sandra Pupatello, are you at all concerned about the prospects of long-term growth in the country? Well, I think like the finance minister, each of us in the role that we have played, we understand how important it is to move on productivity, uh, to get companies to invest in automation, to do all the things it's going to take uh, to move our productivity up. And I think this budget does like it always does. It's the bones of the body and the detail will come as Parliament resumes. Uh, just like bills that are tabled, the detail is in the regulation. So I'm anxious to see what this new agency can do, for example, with innovation. Uh, I am interested to see uh, the, how much more can we can we encourage our small and medium-sized companies to actually go abroad and do good work. Um, and keep in mind, we still have challenges internationally. Uh, we've got these uh, massive movements out there between a war in Ukraine that causing all kinds of issues, some that our generation of people have never witnessed. We didn't live through a war. Uh, we Now that with globalization, we see a greater impact to these global dynamics. And I think we need to deal with it. And I'm I'm proud to see that this government is stepping up and actually planting a flag and saying, you know, we've got to take on these global issues, but we've got to take care of our home front as well. Well, can I just, sure. uh, just comment on that, uh, if, if I might? Um, you know, what the OECD uh, numbers show um, is that uh, Canada's growth will be between 0.7 and 0.8% uh, from 2020 to 2060. That's uh, abysmal. And it's particularly uh, abysmal compared to other countries that are, are going to do better. So there, there, there have got to be reasons for that. And we can talk about uh, how we want to. We can be aspirational. Um, that's great. It's good. Uh, but uh, we, we've got to introduce policies that will actually uh, achieve a better result for, for Canadians. Uh, and we, we have to reduce regulation. We have to lower taxes. Uh, and we, we don't have to create big bureaucracies. Can you imagine bureaucracy to create innovation? I mean, it's a contradiction in terms. What we need to do is liberate the private sector and encourage them to, to, uh, to invest in innovation. That's how it's, it's going to happen. 
Well, I, Joe, I would agree. I would agree on 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 many of your comments uh, over these weeks. But I will say, you, you missed one key factor, and that's jobs. And there's a reason that we need to encourage more immigration. We don't have enough people to fill the jobs that exist today in this country, and that's a good sign. And we are leading other nations on that score uh, because we do have jobs that are going unfilled. We've got to help companies figure out what to do when you don't have enough employees. Uh, and I think the government is addressing some of those things. Um, that's that's a situation that you never faced as a minister, frankly, during your term in government. We we had higher unemployment. The, the world was a different place. And I don't think it's, you know, it's not a factor of blaming governments. It's government finding the wherewithal. How can they help businesses do better in this economy? Well, that's what we're talking about, how effectively to do that. And by the way, I'm in favor of immigration. Uh, but there's a limit to how much immigration uh, can it can achieve, um, and uh, we we need to increase uh, productivity. That is is an absolutely crucial thing, uh, a, a crucial task ahead. And I don't see much uh, in the budget that addresses that uh, that issue. Gary Mar, I'm going to go to you. Uh, obviously, uh, the Canadian energy sector is in the news again with the war in Ukraine uh, being the catalyst for that, uh, maybe European countries starting to wean themselves off of a reliance on Russia. Uh, any thoughts from Alberta about how this is going? Well, Russia provides about 30% of uh, energy supply to Europe. Uh, about 10% of the total production uh, in the world comes from Russia. And so most recently we've seen uh, here in Alberta Senator Joe Manchin has come up to uh, visit the oil sands. He has made a very strong case why we should be thinking about uh, national uh, energy security and also North American continental energy security. And that is part and parcel with national security in a broader sense. Um, you know, the, the announcements on uh, projects uh, to develop energy off the east coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. Very welcome. Uh, some of the uh, tax uh, credits that are available for carbon capture utilization and storage will allow producers here in Western Canada to develop energy in a way that still can meet a net zero by 2050 commitments that uh, have been made by major producers, uh, particularly in the oil sands. And so, as I said, you know, there are some good things that have been in the budget, but we are uh, should always be cautious and know whether or not uh, there is the ability to implement. There, is there capacity to implement some of these ideas? I know Sandra's talked about how a lot of it will come in regulation, and I think it's a legitimate issue to ask, well, is, is the regulation actually going to work? And we've seen in the past with bills like Bill C-69, uh, that it, the implementation has not been very good. I can't think of a major project that has actually passed that regulatory process and been approved. So uh, the second point that I want to make, not just on energy, but just overall uh, that we were talking about during the break is um, you know, really the, uh, the whole area about um, productivity and, and making sure that we have a productivity agenda and that the budget was a missed opportunity to show that Canada has a national long-term vision for prosperity in the country. And the failure to do so uh, will continue to have the effect that capital, investment capital will not be attracted to Canada and will continue to leave the country to go to places where um, the, uh, the circumstances and environment for investment appear to be better. Uh, thanks for that, Gary. Uh, uh, Joe Oliver, uh, you're a former natural resources minister as well, and uh, your thoughts on the energy sector. Well, I, I think, um, you know, this, this issue of capital flight and productivity leads right into uh, to, to the, the tragic consequences of, of uh, counterproductive energy policy. Uh, but it's not only in Canada, it's, it's, it's in Europe and the United States uh, right now. Um, this should be geopolitical events. The tragedy in in in, uh, in the Ukraine um, is, should be a wake up call, uh, because here we are uh, with the third largest proven 
oil reserves in the world, the fourth largest natural gas reserves, um, and unable uh, to, to help uh, the desperate uh, Europeans uh, get off uh, their, their dependency on Russian gas. And, um, you know, they, they made horrific mistakes. Uh, Germany got off, um, decided to uh, get off uh, nuclear power, and now they're uh, you know, they're so dependent on, on Russian gas, they're actually importing coal and opening up their own coal plants. So it's been a, uh, it's been a complete uh, disaster, actually, for them, because prices are up. Um, the environmental uh, impact of their policies has been negative. Uh, they're in a, uh, uh, in a, in a dependency uh, situation at a precisely the time when they, when they don't want uh, that to happen. So their sovereignty has, has been eroded. Um, and, and, you know, the, the energy crisis in Europe actually preceded uh, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine. But here we are back in, in Canada, unable to help. And um, I, I looked at the, um, at the 2030 uh, emissions reduction plan that the government put out before they put out the budget. Um, you know, their, their objective of achieving net zero by 2050 will cost in excess of two trillion dollars um, and that's that's an analysis by by RBC but it was confirmed right, right. in the budget um, right. so uh, you know this is this is immense cost and it's going to uh, affect the living standards of, uh, of every Canadian. Thanks for joining us here at Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with the monthly panel. I'm going to switch it over to Sandra Pupatello. There was a big announcement, I guess, just before the budget on the Bay du Nord uh, Energy Project in Newfoundland and Labrador. Maybe uh, give us a sense. Uh, you've got some Newfoundland and Labrador roots yourself. So give us a sense of how important that project is and how it fits into uh, does it fit into a, a carbon-free future? I, I, I'm getting some mixed well, signals on that. So yeah, it does to me, uh, Tony, because I do think that the whole world needs to take a stepped approach to get to those lower emissions. And right now, what we can produce in Canada is better in emission control than what others are burning at the moment. So if we can get some countries off of coal because they're taking our oil and natural gas, then I think we should do it. And don't forget our specialty in this country with nuclear. Because um, I thought uh, Germany is having a lot of second thoughts these days about the fact that they did go off nuclear, a very clean energy, well, zero emissions uh, in terms of an energy source. And we in Canada produce not just the knowledge and technology, which we should be developing all the time, but the supply chain uh, in Ontario in particular for nuclear is fantastic. So I think we have big economic opportunities to promote nuclear, especially in the kind of you know goal meeting that we want, we want to get to. Um, and I do think that the tragedy of Ukraine has made us all look at energy sources around the world. And, you know, some of us might be shaking our heads, saying, you know, what should we be doing, uh, at least as an interim step? We don't want to take our eye off the ball in terms of getting to a zero uh, carbon future. Uh, but we can help the world and it's going to help Canada as well right now. Uh, Gary Marr, Bay du Nord, sounds like a positive announcement from the federal government. Is that your point of view as well? It is a positive announcement, uh, and uh, you know I've seen some of the uh, images that uh, you know Equinor has put out on it. it. This is a very, very good project. The oil that will come from there will have a relatively lower carbon intensity uh, than some others, and so Sandra's right that this is a um, a better uh, source of oil than many other places in the world. Um, and so I I think it's uh, I think this is a positive development. And hopefully uh, we can uh, get through all of the hurdles to make sure uh, that it goes across the finish line. And Gary, I know you watch this very carefully, but the, the Europeans right now are seeing not just business energy bills, but residential energy bills triple and quadruple and five times uh, what they were paying a mere several months ago. So whatever the reason, uh, there's an energy crisis afoot in, in the continents in this world that I think will make a lot of leaders around the world perhaps take a better look at Canada and what we can offer uh, in terms of solution. Well, and I hope no, that Joe Biden is one of those people because, I mean, Joe Biden has been 
releasing a million barrels of oil a day uh, from the strategic petroleum. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. hear Governor Whitmer from, uh, from Michigan talking about uh, closing Enbridge Line 5 anymore. Yeah, the president knows that uh, the price of gasoline uh, is a significant issue coming up to midterm elections in November of 2022. So uh, you don't have to go to Europe to look to um, people who are concerned about uh, the growing cost of energy as part of their overall basket of expenditures. Uh, you only have to look here in Canada itself um, and, um, and in the United States. Joe Oliver, we've got about a minute left. You've got the last mm -hmm. word on this. Well, listening, uh, you may find this surprising, but uh, li listening to uh, Sandra uh, talk uh, about uh, Bay de Noor reminded me of Leonard Cohn's uh, uh, song, uh, Hallelujah, because finally, uh, finally the- Mark the this case, are... Joe. You're not agreeing with me, are you? <laughs> well, I, I know, actually, you're agreeing with me. I've been talking for a very long time about- <laughs> Oh, you had to come to G with Logan on the oil sands, I, Joe, may I speak? So actually, I know, you had a big education may, may I speak? on the oil sands. May, may I speak? Um, Joe's got the floor. The, um, the, uh, the point is uh, that the ability- of Canada to export our immense oil and gas uh, can reduce net global emissions by getting countries, particularly in Asia, off the use of coal. And I've been saying that uh, for a very long time, and it's 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 a, a critical reality. I'm, I'm very happy about Bay de Noor, but we have to develop other resources to get our oil and gas to tidewater and on to overseas markets. This Hallelujah, is brother. Hallelujah. Exactly. We're going to have to we're going to have to leave it at that for now. But uh, I think that it, this shows that we've got so much to talk about. We'll actually come back in three weeks time. I want to thank the panel for their time today, however. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Another spirited discussion by the monthly panel. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a few things. I certainly did. And they'll be back next month. I can assure you of that. Thanks for watching. <laughs>